Hey Church, thanks for joining us for Horizon at Home. Pastor James has an incredible message ahead as he takes us through the next part of our series, A Blueprint for Living Faith, as we study the book of James together. I just wanted to share one special announcement with you this morning, and that is that we're about to kick off an Alpha course. If you haven't heard of Alpha before, it is a wonderful course that shares with us the basic elements of the Christian faith. It takes us through step by step what it means to be a Christian and what Christians believe. And I'd say it's, it's fantastic for a couple of purposes. Firstly, it is really a wonderful way to introduce some information, some knowledge about the Christian faith to family or friends who don't know God. Perhaps they've been asking you questions and you don't know quite how to answer. This course is fantastic for them. But it's also great for people who are new, fairly new to the Christian faith. So maybe that's been a journey for you over the last little season and you're really wanting to know more. This course is for you. And the third uh, group of people that it's great for are those who have been Christians for, for perhaps a long time. And, and you kind of feel like now's a good opportunity to go back and to remind yourself on some of the basics. So we'd encourage you, if you're interested in that, can you email us at admin at horizonchurch.org.au and we'll put you in touch with Pastor James and Sarah who are going to lead that course. It's, a, it's going to be weekly, it's online, you can do it from the comfort of your own home uh, and we would encourage you to engage with the group of people that are going to do that and going to grow in faith together. That's enough from me. Enjoy Pastor James's message and make sure you connect with us um, on Zoom uh, on Sunday morning or Sunday night. God bless you. As you can see, I'm recording this from my apartment in Queanbeyan. And we're also now up to part 10 of our series on the book of James. And today we'll be looking at James chapter 5, verses 1 to 6 in particular. Now, in these verses, James is talking to rich people. And he has a warning for them. And it's a warning that I feel is the strongest that you'll come across in James's letter. Actually, the language that James uses here is devastating. And it's going to make us feel uncomfortable. And I think it's very easy at the same time for us to read verses like these and go, this is not about me. And so there's this tension here because I think most of us wouldn't consider ourselves to be rich. You can always point to someone else who has more, who earns more money, who has a bigger house, whatever it is. And we read verses about wealth and giving and we point to richer people and say, go after them. They're the problem. But the reality is that we live in a time and a place where a lot of us are pretty well off. Just by virtue of being born in Australia, we have to admit that we are well taken care of. And so just to highlight this point, I found an organization that allows you to compare your relative income to that of the rest of the world. And the organization is called Giving What We Can. And their calculator, it's based on research done by economists and by financial statisticians. And if you're interested, you can look up exactly how they calculate um, these stats. And so just by way of example, I took the median income in Australia reported by the Australian Bureau of statistics, which is roughly $76,000. And I just wanted to see how that compared with the rest of the world. And what I found was that if you are a single adult and you earn the median wage in Australia, you're taking home roughly $60,000 after tax, then you are richer than 97.8% of the world. If you're a family of two adults and you have two children with both parents earning the median wage in Australia, you're roughly taking home $121,000 after tax, then you're still richer than 95.7% of the world. And this really puts things in perspective for me. And I'm highlighting it here because it tells us a simple truth, which is that most Australians are actually wealthy people. But so often we compare ourselves to those around us and when the people around us have what we have or if they have more than us, we start thinking that we aren't wealthy. 
But this really tells us a different story, doesn't it? And I'm not holding this up to say, if you're earning more than X amount of dollars, then this message is for you. Or if you earn less than X amount of dollars, then this message isn't about you. That's not the point. This is just to highlight a simple truth that we live in a time and a place where actually most of us are well taken care of. And so as you listen to these words in James, what I beg you to do is to come to this with an open mind. Don't assume that this doesn't apply to you. Whenever we come to scripture, we want to see what's there for us. God wants to speak to us and we need to be ready to listen, even if it's uncomfortable. So let's start reading. This is James chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Those are pretty intense words. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. James is talking to rich people, people who have hoarded wealth. And he says, you might find comfort in your wealth right now, but really you should be distraught. He says, if only you knew of the misery that is coming on you, you wouldn't be so content. And there is a bit of context here that is really important to understand. And that is James is talking about the return of Christ. And a core part of our belief as Christians is that Jesus will return to earth one day. Revelation, for example, tells us that Jesus will come proclaiming justice and holding to account those who refuse to repent of the evil they have caused on earth. And so Jesus' return has this judgment attached to it. When Jesus returns, he makes a final stand. He deals with evil forever and he vindicates those that have been faithful to him. But James here is emphasizing that this judgment that comes with Jesus' return is going to cause misery for those who stand opposed to God. So what is it here that stands in opposition to God? Well, in verse 2, James points out that these people who have hoarded wealth, these people who have accumulated lots of stuff, they'll watch it rot. He says moths will eat their clothes, their gold and silver will corrode. So is wealth the issue? Well, not exactly. The wealth itself, I don't think, is the issue here. It's what people do with the wealth that's the issue. In verse 3, James says, it's the corrosion of their wealth that will testify against them. Not the wealth itself, but its corrosion. If you've held on to your money for so long that you see it start to corrode, it means you've done nothing with it. If your clothes are moth-eaten and they've been sitting in your wardrobe for so long not being used, it's this image of acquiring more and more stuff just for yourself without any thought for other people, not using it in any practical way, with the irony being that you'll watch it fade away and rot because you've hoarded up so much stuff that you don't actually need. You've got so much stuff just sitting around, it's going to waste. And what's crazy about this is that it's so counter to our culture today. Usually if somebody passed away and they had a bunch of stuff, we would say, man, what a blessing. What a blessed life that person lived. But what scripture says is no, all those possessions that person built up for themselves, they're actually going to be evidence against them. In other words, their assets have all of a sudden become liabilities. And these verses paint a picture of a courtroom where you've been accused of a crime. You've been accused of neglecting the poor and the disadvantaged. And you're standing in the courtroom, you're pleading your case, you're saying, no, that can't be true. I gave to charity. I went to church. And the evidence starts being brought out against you. And it's all your possessions. It's all the excesses and the luxuries. Here is all the stuff that testifies against you. The stuff that says, 
you have hoarded wealth. And so in this picture, the crime that you've been accused of is neglecting the poor and the disadvantaged. In other words, you haven't been practicing true religion. James is saying, here's the proof that you weren't about the widows and the orphans. And there's a clear link here back to James chapter 1, verse 27, which says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after widows and orphans in their distress. Looking after widows and orphans in their distress is about caring for the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people in society. And in this picture, this person has not used what they have been given, their money, their wealth, their assets. They haven't used those things to care for the poor and the disadvantaged people in our world. And that person is not practicing true religion. And there's another link here in these verses to the end of chapter 4. James 4 verse 17 says this, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. When you know there is something good that you can do and you don't do it, that's sin. It's not just when I speak negatively about someone else or lie or steal or whatever. No, it's when I know that there's something else that I could be doing and instead of using my wealth to do something about it, I keep it for myself. Instead of investing in all these other people, I'm storing up treasure for myself. And James is saying, now all this stuff that you've stored up for yourself, it's actually evidence that you didn't care about other people. You knew that there was this great need out there, but you didn't truly care about those other people. You were only thinking about yourself. You were storing up possessions for yourself. And he says you did it in the last days at a time when so many people don't know Jesus at a time when people are desperate for care and support. What a waste. James goes on to say this, verses four to six. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived in earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. So now James confronts any dishonest behavior. Those who have held something back and thought they got away with it. The example there is withholding money from workers in the field. And he's saying, if you thought that you got away with it, actually, you didn't get away with anything. Because the cries of those people who were the victims, God literally heard them. And he's continuing this image of a courtroom and he's saying, if you've done anything illegal, anything deceptive or to the detriment of others, thinking that you may have cheated them even a little bit, no, we didn't get away with anything because God himself is the judge in this courtroom. And he not only gets to decide what is right and wrong, but he can't be deceived. And so in the next verse, he says, you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. They're words that they refer to living an easy life, really setting yourself up to be comfortable. And he says, if you're doing that, and that's just like an animal being fattened up for the slaughter. That's a powerful image. It's, it's this image of someone who's just consuming more and more for themselves and just like an animal, completely unaware of what awaits them in the future. And this person who hoards wealth, who lives in luxury and self-indulgence like an animal, fattening themselves, they're completely unaware of the judgment that awaits them. And then in verse 6, he finishes this section by saying, you have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. It's like after hearing all the accusations being brought against us, we get to see the result of our actions, this life of luxury and self-indulgence, 
all the wealth we've hoarded for ourselves, all this time we've spent fattening ourselves, it could have been used to help other people. And actually, by holding it back, we've caused the death of innocent people. He says, you might as well have murdered them because the result is the same. Innocent people have died. And this picture of the courtroom, it still resonates here. And it's like standing before God, the judge, being accused of neglecting the poor and the disadvantaged with all this evidence brought against you, seeing all the people you could have helped but didn't, and then having the verdict read out. Guilty. That's the picture that James paints here, and it's a serious warning for us. So in these six verses, I think we learn what God really cares about. He cares about the poor, the vulnerable, and the disadvantaged, the forgotten and unloved people in this world. And we learn what makes him mad when rich people sit back and do nothing. Because this isn't what a believer does. We don't just live for ourselves, sitting here in our self-indulgence, setting ourselves up in the best position possible. In fact, that's the very thing that Jesus sets us free from. That self-centeredness, that self-indulgence, that's part of our old selves. When we accepted Jesus into our hearts, Jesus replaced those things with a love for him and a love for people. Jesus has transformed us. And at the same time, he's empowered us to love other people. And a practical way that we can show that is when we use our resources to partner with God and invest in other people. When we partner with God and invest in other people. So we need to start asking ourselves some hard questions. And the first is, what is God's word saying to me? And I've been preaching for long enough to know that whenever money is talked about, people get defensive. And like I said at the start, I think it's very easy for us to read these verses and go, this isn't about me. There are richer people out there. Go after them. They're the problem. And all I'm saying here is read James's letter read it in its entirety, and then come back to these verses in James chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, and go, okay, what does it say to me? Not looking around and seeing what everyone else is doing, not getting caught up in comparing yourself with what you have compared to your neighbor. That's not the benchmark. Tune out all the other voices and ask, God, what are you saying to me through this? get into the word and honestly ask, am I guilty of this neglect that James is talking about? And if that's the case, then we need to look in our hearts and ask, why do I long for these things so much? Why am I acquiring more and more stuff just for myself and neglecting those in need? We need to ask, what's in my heart? And if you look inside and you find yourself saying, I really want this thing or my heart desperately desires this possession, then we need to recenter ourselves like James does in this passage by changing the focus from our wealth and our possessions to Jesus return. Because as believers, we are supposed to be consumed with this idea that Jesus will return. And when he returns, he's going to usher in the next life with a new heaven and a new earth. That's something that's, so much better than any material possessions that we could ever have in this life. And I also think there's a a danger here of maybe turning this into some sort of legalistic thing by going, I think it's okay for people to spend X amount of dollars on their car, or I think it's okay for people to spend X amount of dollars on their house saying, you know, this is the amount of money that's okay to spend before it becomes a sin. Or maybe saying things like people are allowed to have this particular possession, but not this other thing. I think if we start thinking like that, we're missing the point because again, as believers, what we're supposed to be characterized by is that we're not attached to the things of this world. And so let's not argue about certain possessions as being good or bad or 
how much is right to spend on something or whether it's right to have it at all. Instead, we each as individuals need to look in our hearts and see if we find ourselves longing for Jesus' return because that will put everything else into perspective. And so in light of Jesus' return, these verses are getting us to think through and ask, does it really make sense for me to keep storing up more and more just for me? If I know that in the end, a new heaven and a new earth awaits me. If I know that this life is short, if I know that God wants me to look after the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people, does it really make sense for me to keep storing up more and more just for me? Does it really make sense when other people are dying right now just for a lack of food, a lack of clothes, a lack of water? Does it really make sense biblically? That's what I want to know because there are some serious issues with our world and the reality is that we are in a position to do something about it. And if God cares about the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people, then he would love it if we would consider that there are people being trafficked and sold into slavery. A21 is an organisation that deals with this issue and they estimate that there are around 40, 40 million people enslaved in the world today. That means that actually there are more people enslaved today than at any other time in history. That is a horrendous reality. And I have no doubt that that makes God angry. And it should make us angry too, because God wants us to partner with him and do something about it. God would love it if we would consider that there are children living in extreme poverty. Another organisation, Compassion, they estimate that 356 million children live in extreme poverty. They don't have access to education. Some of them don't have clean water. Some of them are literally starving to death. And when there are people whose children are dying today, like this week, how can I not care? And again, God wants us to partner with him and invest in these people. These are the people that God cares about. God would love it if we would consider that there are millions of people who don't know Jesus. There are people who have never heard the word of God. They've never heard the name of Jesus in Australia. In Australia, there are less and less people identifying as Christians and more people identifying as being non-religious, as having no religion at all. And when I know this, how can I not use my resources to get to them? How can I not invest in my local church, when I know that this is where people learn about who Jesus is. That's where they learn that God has a plan and a purpose for them. Church is where people's lives are changed forever. And I know this because this is where my life was transformed. And I've seen it in so many other lives as well. I've seen people overcome drug addiction. I've seen people healed of abuse and neglect in their life. I've seen churches support communities in times of crisis. And I've seen them reach out to the lost and the broken, giving hope to the hopeless. And if you believe in the purpose of this church, then use your resources to partner with us, not out of this guilt or compulsion, but out of joy, out of this excitement in knowing that God is going to do something powerful with what you have to offer, something so much more powerful than what you could have done on your own. And again, God is saying, partner with him and invest in people. And my intention here is to not make you feel condemned. Instead, we should be thinking of this as an opportunity to partner with God and invest in people. To reach out to the lost, the broken and the hurting, to look at this as an opportunity to practice true religion to use your wealth to look after the orphans and the widows in their distress, to look after the most vulnerable and unloved people in this world. In the light of Jesus' return, James is saying, true religion is not storing up wealth for ourselves. It's using your wealth to help those most in need. That includes giving to charity, fighting for social justice causes. It includes giving to your local church. This is a call to partner with God and invest 
in people. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we come before you this morning, we come before you with humility. And Lord, if there have been times in our lives where we have neglected the poor, where we've hoarded our wealth, where we've used our wealth for our own self-indulgence, we ask, Lord, for your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord. And we ask that you would stir something in our hearts, Lord, something in our hearts that changes the focus from our possessions to Jesus' return. I pray, Lord, that what I've spoken about today doesn't just become head knowledge, that we actually take this to our hearts and start thinking about the most disadvantaged and vulnerable people in our world, thinking about all those people who don't know Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that you would show us where you want us to spend our money. Our money, Lord, that ultimately comes from you. I pray, Lord, that you would show us clearly what these verses mean for each of us as individuals, that we would take the time to really delve into your word, knowing, Lord, that you will speak to us personally and clearly. We ask this in your mighty name. Amen.